Thank you all for being here. I'm delighted to be here with David Argos, who has been a real pioneer uh, in the field of medicine. And also, we are very lucky that he has had the megaphone recently, and so more and more people are listening and paying attention to your message. Thank uh, you. This um, is um, one of 21 sessions that uh, the World Economic Forum has started this year of one-on-one -on -one conversations, a new um, feature of uh, Davos. And uh, this morning I was um, privileged to have a conversation with Dr. Oz and uh, this afternoon with Dr. Agus. And if we could listen to what you and Mehmet are saying, we would be a much healthier society. So let me just start by saying that one of the unusual things about your life is that you are both a professor of engineering and a professor of medicine. And also, um, not as unusual, but still kind of adorable, a pretty devoted dad who has throughout everything maintained this website where we can track what your two children and your dog Yogi are doing <laughs> at any point. And um, you recently wrote that Miles is the coolest kid. So I want to start by asking, why is Miles the coolest kid? And how does Sydney, his sister, feel about that? No. <laughs> They're both great. You know, Miles has a passion for science, um, which is great. And Sydney has a passion for learning. So to see our next generation get excited about things. You know, uh, last month I did some of those Sal Khan videos from the Khan Academy, where you could tell kids about science. And it's just so amazing that within a week or two, 100,000 kids can see science and they get it. So your, your book uh, has that same spirit of passion and optimism. In fact, the title itself, The End of Illness, is pretty stunning. And um, it was a title which was given to you by Steve Jobs, whom yeah. you cared for for over five years. So why did you come up uh, together with um, Steve Jobs with this very bold uh, declaration about what's going to happen to our lives? You know, I, I'm a cancer doctor. I see two or three people a week, and I have to say, I've got no more medicines for you. Unfortunately, you're going to pass away from cancer, and cancer wins. And I can't do that anymore. So first of all, I want to make a declaration that we have to prevent disease. We are much better at preventing things than treating things, yet we're not doing it, and it's frustrating. Healthcare in the United States is 16.5% of gross domestic product, and it's growing. The only way we're going to make an impact is to stop it. So the end of illness is a bold declaration, approach healthcare differently as a complex system, not in reductionist. Take one pill, supplement something, look at the whole picture. It's much more of an Eastern philosophy in one sense, but it's grounded on engineering and science. Well, that's what I love about everything you've been saying, that it is so bold. And since the theme of Davos this year is great transformations, it is truly about great transformations. So what has been the greatest resistance to your message? You know, the Daily Mail uh, published an excerpt from the book a couple days ago. We got 7,000 negative emails. I think I got three positive. Um, but part of it, and everyone says, well, that's the Daily Mail. But, uh, and I don't know much about the UK press. You get a lot of positive uh, uh, comments when you post on the Huffington Post. I'm ready. I'm there. I love the Huffington Post. Um, but, you know, one of the declarations in the book is about vitamins. And this notion that there is yet to be a positive study, randomized fashion, showing vitamins have benefit for heart disease or cancer. And in fact, most of the studies have a trend or a statistical negative. If a man takes a vitamin E a day, his risk of prostate cancer is 17% elevated. And it lasts for three to four years after stopping vitamin E. So think of it from a society basis. The most common non-skin cancer in men, 17% elevated. Society is paying that cost. If a woman takes a multivitamin or iron, her risk of death is higher. Death is a hell of a complication. You start to look through these, these studies and they're all negative. None are positive and I don't get it. All a vitamin is is something the body can't synthesize enough of. It doesn't mean more is better. So what about um, other drugs, um, prescription drugs? Yeah, that's the other thing that people jump on me about because we do talk about some drugs. And again, I think some drugs are good. And everyone says, you're backed by the pharmaceutical companies. I have no backing by any pharmaceutical company. But if you look at it, evolution selects out for who has good kids. Evolution doesn't select out for who lives till their 90s or 100. And so we need to optimize or tweak a little. And the predominant way we need to tweak is blocking inflammation. So look at a drug that's been around for a long time called aspirin. 
If one takes aspirin, one's risk of death from colon cancer is down 60%. One's risk of all cancers is down 18%. And delay heart attack and stroke by taking an aspirin. Look at statins like Lipitor. They were developed to lower cholesterol, but if you take someone with a normal cholesterol and put them on a statin, you'll reduce the incidence of cancer by 40%. Can you think of the impact on society of reducing the cancer by 40%? You know, I first told this at one of the World Economic Forum retreats in Abu Dhabi, and some guy gets up there and goes, Agus, you can't talk like this. I go, what do you mean? He goes, well, the pensions are set up for lots of people to die in their 50s, 60s, and 70s. You're going to screw up all our pensions. <laughs> well, in fact, that brings us into to politics. And one of your um, campaigns has been to try and get politicians to talk about health, as opposed to talking just about health care, to talk about what's critical to our lives rather than just how we finance it. How are you doing with that? Poorly, um, very poorly. You know, there's X bandwidth for health in Washington um, and in any country. And when almost all of it is spent on health care finance, there's none to be pushed elsewhere. The way we're going to get real health care reform is changing things. You know, Michael Dell says, you're welcome to smoke a Dell computer, except I'm going to charge different costs in health insurance for the smokers and the non-smokers. That's powerful. We need culpability and we need to change behavior if we're going to make an impact in health. And what about just some simple lifestyle changes? Like if anybody um, wanted to go away from this session with one simple change they could make in their lives, what would that be? So there's one profound thing where the data is just dramatic and it's simple. It's called regularity and schedule. So, if example, today you had lunch at, oh, everybody's laughing because Davos great, is, great at Davos, this yeah. is the one exception this week, I promise you. But if you have your lunch at noon today and tomorrow at 2 o'clock, for two hours all your stress hormones goes up and your body kind of starts to go into conservation mode saying, something's wrong, i got to save all my energy to flee that lion, so I'm going to shut down a little bit. You don't function well. So I don't care if you have two meals a day or five, it's the regularity part that's key. If you look at the data, there were a group of kids who they put them to bed and they said, left them to their parents, wake them up in 10 and a half hours. Then they said, put them to bed the same time and wake them up 10 and a half hours later. Well, the group that went to bed the same time and got up the same time, over a 20% improvement in cognition. That's good to great right there. The body strives for regularity. You know, you look at things like the Framingham Heart Study. One of the great protective effects was owning a dog. Well, initially we say it's because, you know, the dog relaxes you. Well, the dog puts you on a regular schedule. You get up in the morning to walk that dog. You come home, you don't stay out all night because that dog is to go out. We need to get back to regularity. When you eat, when you sleep, it's simple. David, that's going to be so hard for me. Can you give us a second one? <laughs> <laughs> well, you're going to not like the second one as much. So the second one is, is focusing on inflammation. You're not going to like this at all. But Try you know, me. <laughs> one of the great sources of inflammation is by just walking. And so the problem is, is that the shoes you wear matter. So when you wear those simple Italian shoes with just the, the leather instead of cushioned shoes, that's a lot more pressure on your joints. When you add that up over days, weeks, months, that equals bad things. What about high heels? So, uh, <laughs> you get an exception one day a week. Um, but no, the more you can reduce inflammation, it's things like the flu shot. If you skip the flu shot this year, you would get sick, you'd get better, you'd be fine. But a decade from now, your risk of cancer and heart disease are up because of that week with the inflammation. So I want people to think not just short term, but long term too. So uh, what you said actually about shoes is, uh, is, um, <laughs> is kind of really important for me. We have started a campaign at the Huffington Post in favor of flat shoes, which at right. least is a step That's in the right great. direction, yeah. right? And what we've done is we want to make flat shoes chic. So we do slideshows on all sorts of chic women who are wearing flat shoes, like Carla Bruni. Partly she wears flat shoes because she's married to a midget of a husband, but whatever, <laughs> what, what, whatever, the, whatever the reason, it doesn't matter. Yes. She wears them and makes them chic. So, and the other simple thing I'd love to know what you think is sleep. Yeah. And again, and we're not talking about Davos and everybody's walking around um, sleep deprived, but generally in life, what is the impact of that? It is so important sleep. I mean, sleep is your recovery time. The key to sleep is regularity. If you start to go to bed every night at midnight and get up at 4 a.m., over time your body will regulate its REM sleep so you're going to be healthy and feel good. Some people will get 50% REM sleep, some people 25. It's the component that is restful in the sleep. But the key is the regularity part. 
You can't go to bed one night at 10, the next night at noon, get up at 6 a.m. You notice how during the week you get up you know, at 6 a.m. every morning. On that Saturday morning, you automatically wake up at 6 yeah. o'clock. Your body loves that regularity. It's ready for it. And you know, when you go and take a nap on a weekend and not during the week, it hurts you. It's bad. The, don't give really? me that look. <laughs> no, no, no. We just, we just installed two nap rooms in our offices in New York. So Productivity is going to go down. <laughs> we actually have a saying that says recovery is um, an efficiency enhancement tool. Well, if you nap every day for 15 minutes, it's the greatest thing in the world. If mm -hmm. you nap randomly, it's bad. And the data are just beautiful in that regard, with cognitive performance and with athletic performance. They both correlate. So do you have an absolute belief in all data? Because often data is superseded by data later yep. on, right? Isn't that the nature of science and the progress of science? You know, uh, um, yes. What, you know, I, went to, I was at Dennis Hopper's funeral, and Ed Roche gave me a painting, and it said, Science is Truth Found Out. And it's a beautiful saying. And I asked him, where did you get it? He said, it's written above the science laboratory at Hollywood High School. But if you think of that, we haven't found most truths, as you alluded to. So when you look at studies, whether they be in the press or a medical journal, not all studies are equal. You need to have studies that are large enough, that had the right control. And where it's published matters. If you've never heard of where it's published, chances are it's not real. If it's published in New England Journal of Medicine or The Lancet or a great study, chances are it's real. But one of the great studies ever done, nobody even paid attention to. 1953, um, Jeremiah Morris published on the 26,000 workers in the British Transit Authority. Half were the bus drivers that drove the bus, and half were the ticket takers that walked and took the ticket. Well, they weighed the same, yet the heart attack and death rate was in less than half in the ticket takers. Our notion of exercise today, for example, in America and Europe, is an hour in that gym, and then you sit at your desk all day. Well, that's wrong. The hour at the gym is awesome, but if you sit the rest of the day, you negate it all. And that study was beautiful. 26,000 people showing this benefit. Whereas another study was done here in the United States, 29,000 women looking at calcium and vitamin D supplementation. No effect on bone fracture. Another study with 20,000 women give a high dose of vitamin D. They increased bone fracture by 20%, not decreased it. Remember, we're a complex system. So when you try to correct one node by giving vitamin D, well, you downregulate the receptor and screw up all the signaling. The body's homeostatic. You evolve, we evolved tanning for one purpose, to block vitamin D absorption. So it tells us right there, it's declaring, too much vitamin D is probably bad. Yet we all do it. But what about too little vitamin D? Isn't that bad too? Well, I don't know. There's associations that lower vitamin D is associated with heart disease and cancer. But remember, lower vitamin D is associated with obesity, with smoking, with sedentary lifestyle. There's no data, even though there have been three large studies, giving back vitamin D makes a difference. Yet we do it. When you're low vitamin D, it may just be you have a high vitamin D receptor. When you measure one network of a node, it's meaningless. Yet we all do it all the time. So something is missing here. So how much of your way of looking at the human body um, is based on your engineering. You know, the fact that, as you have said yourself, you know, most doctors uh, look at one particular um, aspect of the human biology, and you are looking at the whole complex system. So, you know, I, I mean, I have the great advantage if I get to work in the laboratory. So we help develop some of the technology to look at genetics for diseases. We now look at the proteins in the blood. We can look at the metabolites, the bacteria in GI tract. All these technologies are hope, but what they show us is there's so many dimensions to us that we can't understand. But you look at a climate modeler, he or she will go out there and look at the shape of the clouds, and they're going to be able to tell what's going on from that, from a downstream readout. Yet we in biology try to look at the, the, the small focus, the one gene. The average cancer on diagnosis is 130 mutations. It's impossible to understand or to model. So we have to take that step back. We have to think more like an engineer than a biologist. If I ask my son, how do you stop a train or my daughter? The answer would be you pull the brake. They don't say, let me calculate the, the, the speed and the temperature of the tract and the air speed. They say you pull the brake. We have to think of diseases more like that. Let's try to change the system, not just correct one little thing. Because every little thing we do changes the rest of our system. So the fact that, as you have written, um, most of our expense in healthcare is in the last two years of life yeah. is obviously partly the result of our political system and partly out of a regular bad habit, right? Of, 
of not uh, doing enough at the beginning. If you reverse that, how would you allocate spending? It's a great question. I'm, I'm a firm believer. You know, when you look at the group age 15 to age 55, we spend almost nothing in healthcare. So I want to start to bring it backwards, right? I want to identify what disease you're up against. We have that technology. I want to push for prevention. You can take a statin. You go to Walmart in the United States, get a 90-day supply for $9. It's not tremendously expensive. And the implications are dramatic on society. I want to have workplaces, and I'm sure you do it, where you encourage employees to get up and walk around. Where in your cafeteria, you say, listen, you're welcome to get a burger, but it's going to cost twice as much as the salad. I'm going to get that burger to subsidize the salad. We have to push toward health. Employers have to care for their employees, just like parents have to care for their children. And if the government says, listen, when you're 65 in the United States, no matter what you do, no matter any bad habit, we'll cover all your health, there's something wrong there. Life insurance says, listen, you have a bad habit, we're going to charge you more for life insurance. We have to do the same for health. So I'm sure you get a lot of resistance from libertarians yeah. and uh, who consider this very paternalistic. And your point of view is if you want to do all those things, you're on your own. Well, I mean, why should the rest of society with their mm -hmm. taxes subsidize the people with the bad habits? We have the technology and the therapy to prevent disease. We can delay disease to the 80s and 90s. And the paradox is if you live to past the 80s, we don't spend a tremendous amount in your health care. When someone's in their 90s and they get cancer or have a heart attack, we don't put them on a ventilator. We don't put them on an intensive care unit. We let them die with dignity. 1950 was the last year in the United States you can die from, quote, old age. Now you have to die from a disease. We have to change that. And so the whole conversation, you remember, a few months ago around death panels, you yeah. know, the fear that somehow doctors would make the decision about who lives and who dies which is so fraught with emotion in this country. How would you deal with that? Well, we were a part of that, and it was misplayed out by all the press, except the Huffington Post, of course. Um, but because it wasn't doctors, it was patients making the decision. And the idea was empower a patient with information, and he or she, all the data says, will make a decision in general for not crazy, over-aggressive care. So information will yield good decisions. And you as an individual have a right to say, I want a ventilator of crazy things, or I want to go with dignity. It's your decision and your right. But the key is to discuss that before you're about to die of a disease. Discuss it when you're healthy and make those decisions when you can really think them through based on your value system with your family members. You can't put a blanket. And it wasn't the death panel's doctors making this decision. It was patients. The death panel concept was to educate patients. And how can you be against education? Well, this is part of the way that decisions are politicized, and yeah. that's really what you are fighting against when you talk about some more radical thinking and challenging the conventional wisdom. Well, your book is going to be number one in the New York Times bestseller list. Congratulations a week from Thank this you. Sunday. And uh, you've had a tremendous response to the message. The fact that you're a Steve Jobs doctor has really helped put the spotlight on your message, but the message has been something you've been working on for many, many years. What has been the, the most positive response you've gotten? I mean, we talked about the resistances, right. we talked about the negative comments in the Daily Mail, but what about the most positive, most grateful response? Oh, we're getting lots of those, and it's just so gratifying. It's people coming and saying, I'm changing my life, I'm feeling better. You know, I've been pushing this message for a long time, and obviously the book is a way to scale it. I see patients you know, every day in the clinic, and I say them this message. So on a one-off basis, we've been doing it. Now, to be able to scale it, is powerful and tremendous. And so, you know, we're honored to do it. We're honored to put the data out there and we're passionate to try to change healthcare, not just in the United States, but around the world. I mean, you look at non-communicable diseases in third world countries in sub-Saharan Africa, they're dominant there. They're taking over HIV, malaria, and we have to go into those countries and start to make a change. Food now, food is a major problem in all countries. You know, this notion of we want what we want and food makes no sense. This is the first year since World War II. There's not enough food to go around in the world. In the United States now, the notion is, well, I want asparagus tonight. So you go to the supermarket, you find asparagus that came in from Chile. It sat on the shelf for three days. It has zero nutritional value. We have to go back to the old days and say, what came in fresh today? Or if we can't do that, what flash frozen? Because they flee freeze it within a couple hours of picking. We have to think differently in terms of food. We have to be, not be afraid of recombinant DNA food. It was made in the 70s and 80s for more calories per acre. We gotta start to use science to make food better. 
We have to be sustainable with how we look at fish and other things. Cold water fish is one of the best foods you can have, yet we're not being sustainable in how we bring it in. We have to change that. We need to have a concerted world effort really to say, listen, if we want to be a healthy society, we got to work together with certain principles and tenets to really make things happen. And then lastly, we have to not be afraid of technology. Technology, and there's no one technology. Technology itself will allow us to grow in healthcare. I mean, get a load of this. There are tenfold more bacteria in your body than there are cells in the body. These bacteria, they metabolize your food, they control your hormone levels. So in fact, if you look at breast cancer or prostate cancer in China, it's a tenth of ours. After they moved to the United States, it almost approaches ours after a decade. We always said it's the Burger King McDonald's. No, it's the bacteria. It's the microbiome we call in our GI tract. And for the first time this year, we're able to quantify it with new technology. I guarantee you over the next couple of years, we're gonna to start to change it and modulate it to prevent disease. So it's an exciting time to do what we do. We just can't be afraid of it. But you're also saying that it could be the burger, right? That it could be the food we eat. <laughs> no question about it. But I mean, again, not all burgers are equal, right? A grass-fed beef is certainly fine. Things in moderation are good, right? You don't want to go on a crazy diet one way or the other. You want moderation. You want regularity and schedule. You want to know where your food is from. You want to say, you know, yes, this burger, well, is this a, a force-fed cow of corn or was it a grass-fed beef? You want to say, you know, is this food fresh? Is it not fresh? The more you know, the better. You can't put one class of food and say bad. So as a parent, yes. um, what are you doing with Miles and Sydney? Like they're not allowed to have M&Ms or? No. Um... I mean, it's, it's <laughs> moderation. And again, my message sometimes worked, but I couldn't get my kids to stop chocolate milk. Then all of a sudden, they watched this British chef have a TV show who showed them that at a school that was serving chocolate milk, the sugar in that milk filled an entire school bus. That image stopped them from drinking a, a, a chocolate milk, and it was fantastic. So we have to figure out better ways to educate the kids. You know, Al Gore once told me a story that you know when John Kennedy said we're going to put a man on the moon, people thought he was crazy. Well, nine years later, Neil Armstrong stepped in the moon. The average age in missile command was 28, which means those kids, when he stepped on the moon, were 19 years old. So the people who are going to make the difference in healthcare and technology aren't me and aren't you. It's that next generation. Unless we get them excited about science, excited about medicine and physics and engineering, we're going to lose. So are you planning to do more to educate children specifically? Is yep. that one of I mean, of this the Khan Academy thing blew me away. The impact you can have on kids, and it's so low tech, it's so simple, yet kids get it. You know, we put story on there, cancer is a complex system, and I got emails from third graders asking questions about it. It's wild, but we got to get kids excited about that. I never had that when I was young. Of course, you do realize, because you do write about it, that you're going to get very powerful interests against you. Mm -hmm. uh, very powerful interests in terms of the sugar lobby and the Burger King lobby. <laughs> and uh, you actually said here, uh, you wrote in the Wall Street Journal in, in January, that the federal agency that administers Medicare pays over half of the medical bills in the U.S., but it doesn't retrieve, organize, or mine the data. Imagine how much better the Medicare system could be if all the data were analyzed to improve public health. It's wild. I mean, you think about it. We are the most backwards field in the world. This healthcare, Europe, U.S., every country, we've never decided on data elements. So that's why, you know, my hospital calls it a broken leg. The hospital next door calls it a fractured leg. So we haven't even come up with standard elements to call diseases. Once we get to, we can actually collect data, which we aren't doing, but if we get there, we still can't use it yet. We want to learn from every experience. I want, when you go to your doctor, you to start to populate databases so that tomorrow, your children or even you can benefit from it. I want us to get better every day as we go in healthcare. And you know, people can scream at me, the lobbies can get upset, but I don't care, bring it on. I mean, I look at death every day in patients. Mm -hmm. and when you look at that eye, you look in someone's eye and you see that, you don't care who fights back. You have to change things. And one of the ways that you're advocating to change things is with genetic screening. You know, genetics is a metaphor for technology. I want technology to come into place because we don't know what we're doing. Remember, in 1997, a 25-year-old kid went into the best cancer centers in the United States. He had germ cell tumor in the brain, the lung, and the liver, and they told him, listen, chemotherapy is going to make you sick. Spend your last couple months with your family. Instead, this kid went to Indianapolis and got platinum, the same thing in my ring here. He got it because some goofball doc said, do cancer cells like electricity or not? 
They happened to use platinum electrodes and it killed some cells. A year and a half later, he won his first of seven tours to France. I don't know why platinum cured Lance Armstrong, but we have to collect this data. Our country, Europe, is so good at reporting the negative. I only have to tell the EU or the FDA when something bad happens. I never have to tell them when something good happens. I want to collect these experiences that we're all going through every day, learn from them so we can get better and better. So what about the, the data that's been collected around um, things that are not scientific, like the power of prayer to yeah. heal people, or positive thinking, or visualization, or whatever name you want to give it? So I believe in all of those. I don't know how to quantify those. You know, the problem is if I said, Ariana, what is health? What's your answer? Is it how long you live? Is it how you look? Is it your weight? Is it your cholesterol? Is it how you sleep? I don't know what health is. So we haven't yet developed a marker for health. But think of with the technology. So proteomics technology is you put a drop of blood in a superconducting magnet. You get a 60 gigabyte picture of all the proteins in the blood. You get a picture of the state of you. Well, what, is, what if I can measure you with prayer or without prayer and say, how does that affect heart disease? How does that affect cancer? I can actually quantify it. Because whenever you start to bucketize things, we get screwed up in our field. Prayer isn't prayer. Positive thinking isn't positive thinking. It affects everybody differently. We're not one size fits all. And you can't say that each of these are the same. But if we have something to measure, we can optimize it and do it right. But could it be then that some of the most important things in our lives that affect us very profoundly are not quantifiable? No question about it, but you have to develop a metric. Right? You have to know what to do for you. Everybody's different. And so your metric can be, listen, I want to know how well I sleep. So what I did was, you know, red wine is good for you. I believe that. The problem was it affected my sleep. So I would get one of those little monitors that you put on your wrist when you sleep, and I would write down one glass of wine, and I looked how I slept. I would do two glasses of wine, one and a half. And I realized if I got past one and a quarter, I didn't sleep well. So I developed a metric for me and optimized my behavior. We have to do that with everything. If you're going to do meditation, you've got to say, listen, my goal for meditation is I'm relaxed the rest of the day. Develop a metric for it. Write it down. Start to optimize things. Well, actually, that's um, very much along the lines of something I've been thinking about. And wherever I go, where there are technologists, and I'm sure there are some here, engineers, you are one, of course, uh, is can we develop a kind of GPS for the soul? You know how um, we, can we track how we are actually uh, measuring stress during the day, not, not when it gets so bad that, uh, as you said, we move into um, fighting disease mode, but uh, while we can still prevent it. And then um, personalize the response so that if we can see we're off course, uh, we can personalize an app. I think of it as an app. You know, we can call it iSoul. There's a new technology, get a load of this, <laughs> where you could put your finger and it costs $100 on Amazon and it measures your heart rate. Well, when you relax, your heart rate is exactly equal. When you're a little bit stressed, it's off by a hundredth of a millisecond. When you're very stressed, it's off by a millisecond. And so you put it in, if you're relaxed, it's green. If you're a little bit stressed, it's yellow. And you learn how to push yourself from yellow to green. It's like a mood ring, it's biofeedback. But it's a metric where we know it's very hard to go from red when you're stressed all the way to relaxed. Right. But you're a little bit stressed, it's a lot easier to go back to green. Exactly. So, so we need to figure this out. Okay, so we'll work on that together. Okay. I'm, I'm ready. <laughs> I'm going to try to clone the soul and then we can start to manipulate it. And, uh, <laughs> you're a little bit ahead of me, but the point is that we need to bring everything together. You know, mm -hmm. both the most basic things like regularity, sleep, the kind of shoes we wear, and the most uh, ethereal, mystical, mm -hmm. unmeasurable things, yep. which nevertheless are important. I mean, that's what is so interesting in your message. No question. And then my, you know, I treat with cancer patients. And so to me, the most important thing is not what drug or what gene, it's hope. I mean, hope is the most important thing I've ever seen in patients. And it's something that while I can't write down what it is, you know it when you see it. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you, when hope is lost, everything goes down. And uh, when you've seen patients who are losing hope or have lost hope, have you found anything that can restore it? It's, you know, it, you know, what I bring is I bring the kids who work in our laboratory and I bring them into the clinic. <laughs> Everybody, all 30 kids who work in our laboratory, I call them kids, but they're not. 30 people who work in our laboratory, they come and see patients once a month. Because to a patient, they're hope personified. Mm -hmm. They're working on the treatment, the cure. And those people who, from the lab who come in, they don't go home that night. They go back to the lab. They stay up all night working on their drug or their technology. 
I want the intersection of hope, which is technology and new drugs and what's going on in the lab, and the clinic to come together, not to be separate worlds. But at the same time, as you have said, um, hope has to be um, to go hand in hand with realism because yeah. you described the way you know Steve Jobs fired you a few times when his results were not as he had visualized them. Yeah. So there is also that. No question about it. You know, I was honored to be part of a team that took care of Steve. But like any cancer patient, there are ups and downs. And the key is, you know, there's an old term I learned when I trained in medicine Hopkins called equinimitas, even keeledness. You know, me as a physician, I have to be even keeled and I have to bring truth to patients. You can't sugarcoat it. You have to be a realist, but at the same time, you can't take away that hope component. It's always there. There's that story of Lance Armstrong that every cancer patient in their back of their mind hopes it's then. And he's a beacon of hope for all of us. Well, you've been a beacon of hope for us. Thank you so much for doing it all with so much passion and conviction. And thank you for your message and congratulations on the book. Thank you so much, Ariana.